I turned to my colleagues and inquired as to how should I respond to such an introduction. But a lot of things said I don't remember. <laughs> and uh, I think it was Lyndon Johnson, I think, that went to the joint session of, of Parliament in Ottawa, Canada, and was heard to say to them after he was introduced, um, my father would have thanked you, and my mother would have believed you. <laughs> uh, to my cabinet colleagues, Deputy Prime Minister, and all those who are here present, honored and distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Uh, in this 49th year of celebration of our nation as a fully independent Commonwealth of the Bahamas, I hope that each of you has found many reasons to affirm and proclaim why you are proud to be a Bahamian. Pride is not normally a concept which I champion myself, but when it is contrasted with the idea of humility, I believe it to be an essential trait in those of us who aspire to servant leadership. But the sense of national pride, which we have been promoting in this year's independence celebrations, instead speaks to the sense of dignity, self-worth, and achievement that we have attained in the 49 years since the birth of our nation. And as we witnessed in the cultural show on Clifford Park on Saturday night, despite all the challenges past and present, as Bahamians, we have so much to be proud of. I take special pride and great pleasure in being invited to deliver this lecture this evening. The institution of the University of the Bahamas was an essential part of the dream and promise of independence, created to be home to a flourishing of ideas and host the vigorous and rigorous debate. I am grateful, therefore, for the invitation and the opportunity to share my thoughts on the National Development Plan for the Bahamas. The lectures which I enjoy most, both enlightened and provoke. And so I'm looking forward to the discussion afterwards, which will surely indicate whether I have succeeded in delivering either. In thinking about how to address the subject, I first considered the most direct approach. I thought to reflect on the findings of the National Development Plan to date and set out some of the priorities of our administration in completing and implementing them. But this would have been enlightenment without provocation. The provocation, or rather the things upon which we might not all agree, will hopefully prove more fertile for discussion and debate. So, the National Development Plan for the Bahamas, or indeed for any nation, is not static. It is a dynamic document, essentially detailing the myriad of challenges and opportunities for the country. It's perhaps best understood in the negative. Without a National Development Plan, the government of the day has to make decisions and choices, most of which are based on short-term needs. Given our five-year electoral cycle, it is easy to spend money on visible outcomes, which might be sufficiently impressive to inspire a few votes. But the money might be better spent on less visible outcomes, such as improving coastal defenses, which would prevent long-term coastal erosion. Without a plan, governments would also have to start every initiative from scratch, obtaining basic data, formulating options, and consulting the public before determining a course of action. Any rigorous planning exercise done properly and well helps to ensure success. It does not guarantee it, but without, but without a plan, success is likely to be far more elusive. The National Development Plan for the Bahamas benefited 
by having input from Bahamians from each part of the country and every walk of life. The results, therefore, form a consensus of, of what Bahamians think needs to be done in order to move the country forward. The data contained in the plan and the recommendations built upon it are refined into a number of specific, tangible goals with strategies attached on how to deliver them. The advantage of this is that we are able to understand what success looks like. That said, it is not the specific step-by-step -step planning document which some imagine it to be. The government of the day would still need to detail substantive policy and a delivery plan in order to make it effective. In other words, each administration still has a responsibility in determining how specific goals are to be delivered. This takes us back to the choices and priorities of individual administrations. And this is where vast differences of approach can and will emerge. As we move forward, perhaps political debate might be structured around key focal points of the plan. For example, as the plan calls for the provision of adequate funding for education, political parties could be challenged to say what they think constitutes adequate funding, how it will be sourced, and how it would be spent. My earlier point about the dynamic nature of development planning was to hint at more than the evolving needs of our country over the short, medium, and long terms. The context, the context becomes king insofar as the realities of the day will have great influence on the priorities and perceptions of the time. Whatever those are, it is also to emphasize that the context didn't come out of nothing. We do not start with a blank sheet and on it sketch out our version of paradise. No, we have to start with what we have inherited from previous administrations and previous generations. Even though they may not have used the language of national development, their decisions and actions continue to shape our present reality. And the influence is not merely historical. There are Bahamians today who still hold dear some vision, some version of earlier ideas of national development. Are they wrong to do so? Of course not. They are Bahamians. And even, and even if they are not of the view of the majority, they still have influence. So let us first consider the pre-independence period, the 20th century up until 1967. We often describe the period in racial terms, focusing on the divide between the ruling white minority and the black majority. But the form of legalized racial oppression that existed the Bahamian version of apartheid in South Africa was supported by an economic system that did all that it could to protect the interests of the minority. In turn, the national development goals and strategies of the day were to stoutly defend and maintain the status quo. Education, health, and economic opportunities were con concentrated on the minority and the economy and the society was structured around those so privileged. One of the most lethal weapons of oppression is the deprivation of education. And so education for the majority stopped shortly after primary school. Healthcare was not universal, nor was the right to vote. As was, wi as was widely reported at the time, particularly by foreign newspapers like the Miami Herald in the 1960s, corruption and conflicts of interest among politicians were endemic. The public treasury was used as a bank for private interests, and the islands of the Bahamas was ruled by a kleptocracy, a kleptocracy whereby land and other natural resources were granted to and exploited for the benefit of the ruling class. That initial parceling out 
of our natural resources means that those who benefited from it were given an enormous head start in terms of the ability to accumulate capital and wealth. Today, we can easily see how that generational wealth has conferred economic security upon those families. This is what enabled the infrastructural interests and holdings they have accrued since. Hopefully, none of this is surprising to anyone. But I mention it because, I mention it because that vision of national development was the structure and foundation inherited by the newly independent Bahamas in 1973. This was the context inherited by Sir Lyndon Bindley and his colleagues. Their approach to national development is captured in the title Dr. Doris Johnson chose for her book, The Quiet Revolution. Quiet because Pinley wanted to ensure that the minority, that the minority wealth holders didn't flee the country, possibly causing the economy to collapse. And the revolution because he also wanted to achieve what the dictionary defines as a possible overthrow of a social order. From 67 to 92, and especially after independence in 1973, the speed and extent of the changes of those years was immense. Up until now, it remains the most transformational time in our post-independence era. If you want to see a tangible expression of those changes, I invite you, have a look at the yellow pages in our telephone directory from 1967 to 1975. And look at the faces of the professionals and the nationalities of the professionals advertising there. When you survey the ads in the yellow pages during that period for doctors, lawyers, accountants, architects, engineers, and so on, it is striking how the racial and national profile changes. Striking also to note the expansion in the number of numbers of qualified Bahamian professionals and new middle class that was created. And once you look at the 1967 yellow pages, I also invite you to look at the yellow pages for 1992 when the Pinling regime was first voted out and you can see the expanse of Bahamian um, professionals that grew from, in some instances, two and three in 1967 to numbers num numbering thousands. Apart from the social transformation, the hallmarks of this period were the creation of the funded, founded foundational institutions and structures of our modern Bahamas, the Central Bank, Royal Bahamas Defense Force, National Insurance Scheme, compulsory education through to high school for all, and of course, the founding of the college, now University of the Bahamas. With the majority now able to be properly educated and given access to the jobs and careers that had been previously denied, a new middle class emerged, one largely composed of members of the racial majority, keen to build homes and businesses and create wealth for themselves and future generations. But with the oligarchical order left intact, it was perhaps foreseeable that an economic glass ceiling would tacitly remain. Despite the unquestionable achievements of the Pinling era, I see two forces at play which undermined progress. Education gave thousands of Bahamians new paths to self-empowerment and opportunity. But the economy was not sufficiently expanded and diversified in order to accommodate them. After the initial bursts of middle class success, educated Bahamians were later encouraged and almost led to, um, to become job seekers rather than people with high ambitions to pursue careers and create wealth. With access to the big sectors of the economy, still largely remaining in the hands of the few. Over time, frustration and cynicism has grown among the many. 
In the context of where we find ourselves today, I see strong similarities between the desire for fundamental transformational change that existed then and the present desire for fundamental transformational change that exists now. Our context derives from the legacy of that time. I shall return to this point later. Suffice it to say, we can fairly characterize the plan for national development during the pending years as the implementation of the quiet revolution. With the first change of government since independence taking place in 1992, national development thereafter featured a more managerial approach. The status quo was largely left intact. A quick glance at some of the biggest initiatives of that time reflect an ideological shift which removed certain economic protections for Bahamians that had been implemented during the Finling years. The repeal of the Immovable Property Act, the privatization of BTC, the monopoly created by the port of entry, the Arawak port, and the extensive roadworks initiatives all allowed private interests to profit magnificently from the government institutions. Other social initiatives, such as the liberalization of the radio, liberalization of the radio airways, introduced similar or sensible free market changes. This proliferation of media, and especially the radio call-in format, was the early version of the social media landscape on which we live today. While the language of the time was about the virtues of capitalism and so on, in fact, public money was used to subsidize many of these projects and create protections against competition and other market forces. And so we see that the priorities of national development shift once again. Privatization did not change the basic economic model and instead shifted the emphasis to the promotion and protection of established economic interests. Notwithstanding the stated goal of having the expanded wealth of trickle down to the wider society, it is not clear that there was in fact any beneficial trickle down effect, but it meant that those who already had significant capital or those who were already able to raise investment and loans, they did very well. The shareholder society, as envisioned, never materialized, instead manifesting growing disparities in income. The Christie years, interspersed with the Ingram years, shifted the focus back to a national development agenda with a more centrist blend of the approaches of Pendling and Ingram. Big, bold initiatives like anchor projects for family islands, BAMSI, urban renewal, national health insurance sought to extend the agenda of the quiet revolution. The doubling of investment in education also signaled a return to Pinling's ideological roots and of course, the launch of a formal national development plan shifted the idea of governance and planning into something far more structured, stable, and long-term. But the basic economic model, unchanged, with the focus on high volume rather than high value tourism. I suspect that the encouragement of large scale foreign direct investments into ventures like Barma and Atlantis probably peaked in the Ingram then Christie years. And so we come to the, to the more recent years. In many ways, it's far too soon to tell what its ultimate legacy will be. I wouldn't want this lecture to stray into some of the current political battles, but I struggle to see any positive impact on national development since 2017. Before Dorian, before COVID, it appeared that the approach to the economy was that of a small business owner where so-called balancing the books was the holy grail of governance. With other goals for the nation, barely articulated and certainly not prioritized. We also see signs of systematic 
efforts to hand over many ordinary functions of the state to the private sector. Although obscured by the lack of transparency exercised by a single man during the rule by emergency orders, the scale of exercise recalls pre-1967, where extremely narrow economic interests were prioritized and favored others over others. And so let's come to the present. History and hindsight are great teachers. So I expect that one day in the future, one of my successors will stand here and tell you what to make of our successes or otherwise. But in terms of our intent, in terms of our, of our own approach to implementing a plan for national development, I'll speak to three elements. The context which we have inherited, the values which form the prism through which we will address the elements, and the priorities which are guiding our administration. Post the context, post-Dorian and post-COVID, both the Bahamas and the world have changed substantially. As with every government, we need to address the overwhelmingly urgent and important short-term issues while setting the country on a sustainable path to, a fulfill, to fulfill a long-term vision. If you haven't already done so, please be sure to read our campaign platform document, A Blueprint for Change. I know that in the past, many have viewed these documents as a campaign exercise, but we are serious about delivering. Indeed, many initiatives are, are already underway and have been fulfilled. In our blueprint, you will find a substantial number of policies to recover, rebuild, and revolutionize our Bahamas. Since 2016, when the research and findings of the formal National Development Plan were being collect collated, we were still paying insufficient attention to what the impact of climate change might be. During this storm, that persuaded even the skeptics that climate change was not a problem of a distant future, but one we must confront right now. Then the COVID-19 pandemic led to both a health and economic crisis. The global aftershocks in terms of rising costs, soaring inflation, the restricted supply chains, all made worse now by the war in Ukraine, are likely to remain challenging for a while yet. If these facts provided provide the context for a national development plan, the answers to the question, what should we do, then our values will guide us as to how to do it. Since becoming party leader in 2017, I have spoken on a number of occasions in Parliament and elsewhere about the values which guide us. We first think of the concept of the promise of independence. I articulated this in Parliament in 2020 during my budget contribution when I said, the promise of independence was more than just freedom from colonial rule. It was also the promise of self-determination the right to lead lives of dignity and purpose. It was the promise of unlocking for the first time real economic opportunity for the majority of the Bahamian people. Every generation needs to fight anew to make these promises real. The second set of values rests on the principles of what I call economic justice and economic dignity. Economic justice is based on the simple but profound idea that an economy will be more successful if it is fairer. It seeks to redress some of the in inequalities created by capitalism. By giving everyone a chance to earn a fair, decent income, everyone will prosper. What does this mean in practice? We will work to make the system of taxation fairer. We will work towards ensuring that workers earn not just a minimum wage, but a livable wage. Complete 
I accept that complete economic equality is an unrealistic goal. What is achievable though, however, and morally compelling for us is to protect that which I believe to be the common denominator of humanity, the joy of life itself. We will ensure that public investment in education, housing, transportation, and so on, benefit the many and not the few. For example, you can see how in just nine months, we have broader access to affordable housing and we made that a priority. This contrasts, of course, with the approach of the previous administration, which was to provide land for those who already had financial success behind them. The concept of economic dignity is closely, closely related to the approach of economic justice. And I fully support what was described as the three pillars of the economic dignity identified essentially by Jean Sperling, who originally coined the term, coined the term economic dignity. Firstly, first pillar, the capacity to care for family and experience its greatest joys. My understanding of family in this sense goes wider than those to whom we are related by blood. Secondly, the pursuit of potential and purpose. My own life experience has shown time and time again that when people have the opportunity to pursue their potential and purpose, even if they need second, third, or even four chances, they do so they are better for it. This thinking informs our approach to education and training, of course, but also to provide another example undergirds our approach to the prevention, for example, to the prevention of crime and the administration of justice. Rather than just engage in punitive policing, we see early interventions and active rehabilitation as part of the solution. The, the third pillar proposes economic participation, economic participation without domination, without domination and humiliation. Even without engaging the extremes of child and slave labor, we are all too familiar with some working practices in the Bahamas, where workers are subjected to all manner of humiliating indignities. And the employers who practice it are often amazed at the poor morale and lack of motivation in their businesses along with the promise of independence and the concepts of economic justice and economic dignity, our final set of animating values go to our view of the proper role and function of the state. As an unashamed holder of progressive values, I do not believe that the state should stand idly by and leave people to just fend for themselves. At the other extreme, I do not believe that the state is there to do everything. People must, people must and should be able to help themselves. <laughs> Taken together, I believe that these values will keep us on the path which Bahamians elected us to pursue, to move closer to fulfilling the ambition and promise of independence, to put people first by ensuring that economic activity is not just a series of metrics, but instead driven by the very human needs for dignity and justice, and to ensure that the state in its drive for efficiency and effectiveness in an emergency does not lose its ability to also act as a good Samaritan. And just to be clear, 
preceding administrations embraced these values to some extent. Post-independence, they certainly all did to some degree, although the most recent administration hopefully represented the lowest point of that commitment. But where I do draw a distinction is in the formal incorporation of these values into policy. We can and will test what we do against these values. We'll do all that we can to succeed. And if we do, it is the Bahamian people who will benefit. <laughs> Earlier, I referred to our blueprint for change, highlighting our compendium of policy initiatives. It is ambitious in scope and in depth, and we accept that. As a matter of practical reality, we need to prioritize. It cannot all happen at once. Yes, there's an argument for saying everything needs to be done, but without a sense of focus, without a sense of priorities, we'll spread ourselves too thinly and end up achieving nothing. Across these nine months in office, we have set our priorities in a number of policy speeches, both here and abroad. In our swearing-in speeches and a speech from the throne, we detail our broad legislative program. In my remarks to the United Nations and at COP26 in Glasgow, I position our foreign policy in terms of climate change and challenge the international community to deliver on the promises they have made. And so, our priorities are interdependent and not mutually exclusive. And so, Firstly, education. I spoke earlier about the deprivation of education as an instrument of oppression. But a more positive way to say that is that education is the path to empowerment and prosperity. <laughs> this has been true of my own personal journey and that of countless others. What is distinctive about our approach? What is distinctive about our approach? Well, we will educate, not just for the broad curriculum, but also to ensure that Bahamians can take advantage of the opportunities we are seeking to stimulate in the orange, green, and blue economies. So, so for example, our support for the LJM Maritime Academy reflects this, along with the launch of, the, of a new school for the creative and performing arts. That said, we also recognize that our cultural norms do not currently support and promote the value of education as they once did. This has given rise to comments such as, book learning isn't everything. And while I agree that the traditional university-based education is not the right path for everyone. A confident grounding in literacy, numeracy, and all other skills which enable someone to function well in one society, these skills remain essential. The grammar of WhatsApp messages and the attitude of what is it, TikTok videos are not reliable foundations for success. And education isn't something that should just happen to young people in schools. It should be a cradle-to-grave experience, an exercise what I call lifelong learning. In the short term, we must address the learning loss of the past few years occasioned by the pandemic. But as we move towards the medium and long term, we will push to improve the standing of training, learning, and education in our communities. We also need to improve our educational attainment levels. Over the years, a system has evolved whereby those people of means pay for their children's education, either here or abroad. I am deeply concerned that those who cannot afford to pay too often do not receive the kind of education that can help them fulfill their potential and purpose. Our second priority is in health and wellness. 
access to good, affordable, reliable health care sits within our ideas about economic justice and dignity. Plans are well advanced to build new clinics and hospitals, but we have a bigger ambition. The recruitment of more doctors and nurses and staff who can give patients the care they need. Strengthening national health insurance to ensure that Bahamians can access that care and support for wellness initiatives that should help to prevent people needing to seek medical attention in the first place. As we transition to achieve these goals, we have put in what I call a stopgap measure, reserving $10 million in this year's budget to cover the cost of catastrophic health care for those who can't afford. <laughs> the economy is our third priority. It is not to say that it's the third most important thing for us. In fact, most national development plans bill out from economic policy. But I use the order to underscore the point that for my administration, we are mindful to put the individual needs of education, health, and wellness on par with the need to have a successful economy. We believe, we believe that fiscal soundness derives from strong economic growth. And by the way, our efforts to diversify the economy do not mean that we are playing down tourism in any way. It remains our most valuable sector, and we think that the potential for growth and value for tourism is still very significant. I've already spoken as to how the principles of economic justice and dignity inform our approach to the National Development Plan. Matters connected to the environment are our fourth priority. By this I mean both the natural and built environment. Perhaps a better way to describe it would be the way we plan to look after our home, whether it's God-given or we have made it ourselves. We have already heard the attention and focus we are giving to the impact of climate change on the Bahamas. We will continue to hear more. Looking ahead, we may have to engage with some very challenging natural events and conditions. Without wishing to bear into something too bleak for this occasion, please understand that when we say that the impact of climate change poses an existential threat to our country, we mean just that. It threatens our very existence, and we can and will and must do something about it. The fifth priority is what we can broadly call cultural and social. I'm not talking about formal culture in the sense of the arts, but culture as in the way we do things here. I'm not alone in thinking that we can do more to build stronger communities and a stronger nation. The conversations and images on social media too often represents us as a violent, conflict-driven people. In our own lives, we know many wonderful Bahamians who do so much to strengthen the ties that bind us. The nurse who stays past her shift to care for a patient who needs her. The teacher who goes the extra mile for a student who is struggling. The grandmother who looks out for the children on her street who might be short on meals or affection. The pastor who knows who in his flock needs extra healing. We shouldn't have a conversation about our national development without acknowledging that the work done by the angels among us should be supported lifted up, and encouraged. <laughs> that is the only way to ensure that we will have such angels in every generation. During the celebrations for the 50th anniversary of independence next year, I hope that we can include this as a part of our national conversation. What do we need to do to make sure that we are developing into the kind of people and society that we want to be. This takes me to the final points I wish to make tonight, which relate to governance. We've already considered the limits and possibilities of a national development plan, 
and review the approaches of previous administrations that have resulted in our present context. I've settled the ideological approach of our administration that I mentioned. Did I mention? It's a new day. I've settled the ideological approach through an iteration of the values that guide us. And I've highlighted how our policy prioritizes uh, and is set out in detail in our blueprint for change and shows how we will approach the short, medium, and long-term needs of national development. Before I finish, I wish to address some issue of governance which I think will act as a break on national development unless we resolve them. The principle among these is the issue of trust. We are, we are at a stage in history where there is very little trust between the people and the government. This is true not just of us here in the Bahamas, but we can do something about it here. In our view, the lack of trust has arisen because of the lack of transparency a lack of accountability, and a lack of delivery. We have already taken steps, and will continue to take steps to improve on each one of these. Our weekly press conferences, statements, video new, news reels are all produced in an attempt to keep the Bahamian people informed about what we are doing. We have also improved media access to ministers so that ministers can give thoughtful answers to questions. Even though it is still early days, we expect to be held accountable for our decisions and actions. And we hope and expect that everyone in political life shares the same willingness to be held accountable. It is a key component in building trust. In fact, lack of accountability especially undermines trust and confidence in government. When people see politicians transgressing, but with no apparent consequences, it's bad for democracy. We are determined to turn things around. Along with trust and accountability, we believe that when we truly deliver for the Bahamian people, when we make real the promises on which they gave us their vote, then trust truly is rebuilt. We will not succeed at everything we do, and everything we do will not produce the benefits we anticipated, but we will continue to try and are confident that we will have more successes than not. But none of it will work unless we work in partnership with the Bahamian people. Even though the country is crying out for change, it is often the case that people want change but don't like to be changed. But if we work together, but if we work together, if every section of society is prepared to work together, that common, loftier goal can come well within our reach. But it requires us to do more than just offer knee-jerk reactions to everyday events. Businesses and centers of learning must play their part. Churches and civic organizations can and should actively support national development. And the members of the press who play such a valuable role in communicating information and shaping opinion are encouraged to also reach higher The draft National Development Plan has been taken off the shelf and uh, in very short order is intended to have the committee reconvene to see how we can settle and not have a draft but a final uh, <laughs> National Development Plan for us all.
national development needs us all to pull together for the betterment of everyone. By working in partnership, we can spend the next 50 years building the kind of Bahamas that each of us knows in our heart is better. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention tonight. I hope, I hope that you feel enlightened, that you've been provoked. God bless you all. Gentlemen, you may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, Prime Minister has agreed to make himself available uh, for some questions um, tonight. Uh, I was uh, intrigued that the Prime Minister ended the way he did uh, because I had a question for him. <laughs> uh, Prime Minister, you mentioned the second draft of the National Development Plan. Is it, and I know that the Blueprint for Change mentions that, the, that your administration will adopt it. So is it the expectation that we could look forward to a formal adoption process for a national development plan for the Bahamas? Yes, you can. And I'm happy to see that you read the Blueprint for Change. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I'm the executive director of the Government Public Policy Institute. I have to read all the documents. <laughs> Thank you very much, sir. Uh, and uh, and is, it, uh, is it the expectation that such an adoption might take place within this year? Or do you have a, not a time frame in mind as yet? The time frame hasn't been set. But okay. um, I think we have to speak to, I did have a very brief conversation earlier this year with Dr. Virgil. And then she paid a, a call on me. And um, we just have to put those pieces together. Um, there are a lot of things happening now, and we need to prioritize this. And, th and this event heightens the need to get it done quickly. <laughs> um, again, yes, uh, there should be a mic uh, floating. Good afternoon, Prime Minister. My name is Monique Munker Hadley, and I want to take this opportunity to thank you and the government for partnering with LJM Maritime Academy. We are the proud parents of Christina Hadley, who's currently on a cadet program in Alaska. Okay. She's 21 years old. She was recruited by Dr. Claire out of Savannah Sound, Eleuthera. The only problem I have is that the initiative is there, the programs are there, the grants are there, but I don't think there's sufficient advertisement for the children to be aware of what is available to them. Everybody calls somebody else a soccer mom. I'm a maritime mom. I tell everybody about maritime <laughs> because, um, like you um, mentioned, education is the key out of poverty. And we are looking forward to Christina returning home. She's a maritime cadet at the only female in that engine room amongst all those men. And let me tell you, we want more females, more males to get on that maritime ship. Thank you so much for partnering at LJM, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's a wonderful opportunity for our young people, uh, both male and female. I've heard them singing the praises of your daughter. I went to a function in Fort Lauderdale um, with, with the Cruise, with the Cruise Association, our foundation that also supports LJM. And what is what is key about attending? Once you are certified in any areas of in the maritime boating industry, the cruise ships that come here have committed themselves to hiring every Bahamian that they can. Most of those cruise ships have uh, persons from the Philippines and the Far East. And it's more economical, economical for them to hire local than to be flying them from that distance to 
to hear the visa issues, any number of issues. And so they are encouraging us and they're working and partnering with us to ensure that we have more. And I do agree that we need to do more about letting our young people know. Um, <laughs> okay, we, we, we have a question in the back, sorry. In the back, yeah. Good evening. Um, I, is it on? I am very um, happy that the lady talked about maritime training. My husband and I, we do ABC maritime training. And we are specifically looking at the at-risk, at um, the, sorry, we're specifically looking at the at-risk youth, those who um, can't read, those who are sitting on the blocks. And um, we feel as if the maritime industry is one that can really, um, you know, it, it, it can help them. We've done research, we've came up with 870 careers in the maritime industry. And um, I feel as if we really need to push that. It's something we can uh, at least be surrounded by water. If they can't do it on land, they can do it in the water. I've done an interview with a young gentleman who, um, he spent two days, he and his friend. And I said, well, how much money do you think you can make? He said, after he gave his friend a few dollars, he buy his gas, he comes up with like $2,400. So you can make it, it's good. We're hoping that you can push it. And um, you know, I want to commend you on um, your plan. Uh, <clears throat> if, if I might just, if I might just um, um, say, we do have a, we're gonna have a limited time for questions. So I'm gonna say, ask you, please, if you can keep your questions as brief as possible, and then we get in as many people in as possible. Don't wanna hinder you, but there you go. Good night. My name is Nathaniel Thompson, and um, I'm a gender queer theorist. And one of the groups that are not in the blueprint for change is LGBTQ plus people. Um, and the question is, um, like former administrations, you often leave out this group of marginalized people, right? We cannot talk about um, a national development plan without the inclusion of LGBTQ plus people. So um, considering that your administration is one of the queerest administrations in Bahamian, in, in Bahamian history. One of the what, sorry? One of the queerest administrations in Bahamian history because there are a bunch of queer people that work in the administration. The question is, how are you going to take care of queer Bahamians? Okay. Well, if you... Uh, uh, come on, folks. I, I, I'll, I'll please, say three on. things. I'll say one thing. One... Please, please. When, when, I, when I spoke, I did not speak about female or male. I spoke about Bahamians. I spoke about Bahamians. And, 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 that is, and that is the way I view all. And if you notice, if, if you're looking for a specific... Um, But, but, okay, but when I'm, I did that, I'm gonna, sorry. I'm, Are you I'm, talking? I'm, okay, hold on, 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 please, please, please. Okay, thank you, thank you. Listen, Point folks. Point is taken, I've heard, Yes. Unheard. Yes, folks, listen, let's have a dialogue. Okay, let's have a dialogue. We, you, let's have a dialogue. All right, I think we have a question on that on that side. Y yes, ma'am. But there's a qu we're gonna rotate it. Good evening, Prime Minister. Congratulations in winning the election. Thank you. I always wanted to say that to you when I see you in person. There, there were only one or two questions that I was fighting because you have covered everything. And what you hadn't said, you had covered it. I have the rest in my little book. 
the challenges under the National Development Plan in which you had discussed, there are gonna be some challenges that we have. And one of them, in relation to our people, the first one were gambling. And you had granted, not you, our government have granted license for gambling because they found out that there were many, there was money in gambling. The other one was when we, when you have traveled and you had discussed many things and that world had discussed with you what their national plans of development are. And the gentleman stood up and he said, LLG, well, you know, I don't know those letters in alphabet, but the only thing that I said was marriage. And then we then know the Christian council then say, we ain't marrying two of the same sex. So that's all right. But my question is marijuana. What are the challenges in discussing the legalization of marijuana for medicinal purposes, right? I work in the workplace, for us, in the place, yeah, I work. And they are young men, some young women. They come to wake, you know, then have it in an illegal, right? So I really need to know what is um, the, your administration plans for the investors, the investors now, Bahamian investors, uh, we're gonna bring in international investors to grow the marijuana and the seeds, or we're gonna have Bahamian investors uh, developing it. Uh, the institution like the College of the Bahamas or BAMSI will give the options to grow this municipal uh, uh, herb. That's, that's what my question. What is the national development plan for the Bahamas for the investment. Yeah, we have a, Thank you very um, much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Uh, the issue of marijuana, the legalization of marijuana, what aspects of it will be legalized is under active consideration by my administration. You would have noted in our blueprint for change that we did acknowledge that medicinal use of marijuana is acceptable to us. Uh, it's just a question of whether we're going to move as far as recreational marijuana, but we are in the process, and you would have heard the Attorney General indicate that he is be coming to Cabinet very shortly with legislation for Cabinet to have a view on where we go from there. But by the end of this year, you know exactly where you're headed, and insofar as investors are concerned, that's our mantra, the Progressive Little Party mantra, is Bahamians first. Thank you. And, they, and I expect Bahamians, I expect Bahamians to be involved in that business. All right. Good evening, Prime Minister. How are you doing? Good evening. Uh, good evening, Bill. fellow Bahamians. Prime Minister, I have a question, and two questions. You said in your presentation that economic equality, if I'm correct, is not an achievable goal. Am I no, correct? No, no, no. no. I'm asking, yes, correct me, I say it's an unrealistic goal. Unrealistic. I say economic equality. Economic equality is as an unrealistic goal. It's not, a, not to discourage anyone from pursuing it, but um, in this construct of our reality, um, you can always need, you can have a, the janitor, the street cleaners, you have, so, so it is, in that context, but that same janitor, right, right, we ought to protect that same janitor to ensure that he, that he has the dignity and the, what I call the most natural common denominator that we all will share, whether you're rich or poor, that is, that is the joys of humanity and life, being able to have the joys of life that the rich man have or the poor man have. And, that, and that's, what I, that's the context in which that is said. Well, well, th thank you, Prime Minister, for clearing that up. And, 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 and as government, we need to ensure that happens. Prime Minister, thank you. I just have one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have some concerns, and perhaps you can clarify for me, on the government's foreign policy as it relates to energy on the international stage. Let me congratulate you for that COP26 speech. That was a brilliant speech. I was very proud of that. But I, but I look forward to engaging the government about its policy as it relates to energy in the local sector, 
course, this is not the time or place to do that, but I engage that and look forward to making my contributions during the National Development Plan on that issue. Thank you. Okay, very well. Yeah. Thank you. He's had his hand up for quite a while. Good evening, Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you so much for Good being evening. here tonight. My name is Paul Malis. I'm representing the National Fisheries Association of the Bahamas, a nonprofit fisheries organization we advocate for fishers. I believe Mr. Eric Carey is over here too, arch rival and also good friend. Um, I'm come to ask you about uh, and to commend you for continuing the policy of the Fisheries Act, commercial fishing for Bahamian citizens only. That's a great achievement and I'm so happy that you're keeping it. But, but I'd also like to say it's a wonderful thing that the Fisheries Act has done. It has given us the framework to implement many of the sustainability goals that we have enact, uh, signed on to through our national development plan. One of them is sustainable fisheries. And one of the things of the Fisheries Act, one of the provisions is that we have a Fisheries Advisory Council. Now this is a very broad council comprised of stakeholders within the fisheries sector. And it is essential as a form of communication between the environmental sector, the commercial fishermen like myself, and the government. And so right now, our minister, Minister Clay Sweeting, the Department of Marine Resources, they need assistance, they need funding, they need uh, uh, pushing from someone like yourself to get this council going, to get our, our sustainable fisheries practices ironed out and in stone. And I. And uh, I would just like to know, uh, what, what, uh, have you had any discussions with the minister regarding this? Well, they've been talking about the, 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 um, fisheries, of course, and in fact, um, a lot of initiatives that have been taken in respect to the fisheries, or the sustainable fisheries, has led to another, what I call, windfall for the Bahamas. I won't, I won't discuss that now. But I, I thought we had appointed the uh, Fisheries Advisory Council. If we haven't, I will get on to, I'll speak with the minister and see where we are with that. But it was my, I thought we had done so, but if we didn't, I'll get on to that. Yes, yes, yes go ahead. Yes, I'm saying that, yes. Okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll look into it. I can't speak to it right now, but I thought we had. Okay. Good evening, everybody. How are you? Um, good evening, Mr. Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister Philip Davis, QC. My name is Kareem Hanchil. I ran in the last election for independent for Garden Hills. Um, I was listening, and I, I, I'm thankful for the for the timeline that you gave us. Now I was very dis disappointed with the way um, Ingram administered the country in terms of oppression and as a 39 year old man, how we could have been forward. Now what, even though you said some great things about the National Development Plan, what I want to know is if the snapshot of the budget, could I use that as an example of the way we think in terms of how we're going to transition how are we going to impact bottom-up economic approach when in terms of energy? Because like I said, when we talk about impact, how do we evaluate impact in terms of when we allocate um, investments? How do we know as citizens and the government, are we able to see the maximum benefit to citizenry versus corporate Bahamas? Because what I seen in the budget I've always seen allocations of investment, the corporate Bahamas, the filter to citizens, which is never the strongest way to impact citizens direct. Especially in 2022, with technology such as renewable, we're talking about direct impact to sourcing systems to homes. What does that do? Versus a corporate company to then reduce cost to me for electricity, when you could now set up a program to empower me to get the technology pay for it through my savings and get paid to produce power for the less fortunate yes. and then convert my gas car into electric car and pay for my savings for my gas yes. so I can empower myself and like you talk about being self-sufficient and helping ourselves first and asking the government to then meet us at a level. 
Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Heard what you said. And, uh, this, this will be the final question. If there are any more, it will be the last one given. Yeah, after. Oh, no, uh, no you, you asked about, the, well, you, you gave, you, you, you yeah. asked the question, you seem to have answered it as well, <laughs> as to some of the things that we could do. You, if, if you talk about what we have in the budget, uh, there's several issues you ask, right? How we can, you, you talk about what I call the bottom up principle of economic principle, you talk about um, energy, talk about self help and energy, savings, and all of that. Who is that, sorry? Who's, who's allocating that, sorry? Which budget? My budget? I, I allocated money for Shell? <laughs> I don't know. I, I, so, so I think you, you're reading the wrong budget. <laughs> And, and, and I tell you one thing, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be Alfred Sears <laughs> if you call some other name. <laughs> but, And I think, you know, you, you, answered a lot of the, you answered most of the questions you asked, and so I thought I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it that. Everyone heard what you had to say, and we take, we take the point. But our budget does take into account our thrust towards um, renewable energy because the, the primary and overarching principle in the budget when it comes to energy is to reduce our carbon footprint. And that's what we're doing. And we've already taken a number of initiatives to that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. Uh -huh. Good night. My name is Carolyn Strawn. And Mr. Prime Minister, I would just love to thank you, take this moment to thank you for the developing plans moving forward. I think it's an awesome plan, and it can work, and it will work in this Bahamas. Now, like you had said before, in life, the government can only do some things. You cannot expect the government to do everything. In life, there are choices that we make. You may decide to be a, a man. You may decide to be a woman, or you may decide to be a shim. Whatever the situation is, I think that's your choice. Right now, I'm looking at it. You're talking about what we can do for the queer people, what we can do for the normal people. Because right now, the, the queer voices, as I see it, has all the opportunities. They, in Atlanta, they in Georgia, they all over the world. Where are the normal people going to be taken care of? We don't have a problem with nobody because we are all one people. We treat everybody where you're queer, you're normal, or whatever. We treat all alike in this Bahamas. As a matter of fact, we give them more opportunity than we give the normal. So my thing is, when you decide to make your choice, know how you're making your choice because the government is not responsible for your choice, okay? The government is not responsible for your choice. The choice that you make, because God said in his will, we are a religious back state. He said that is the reason a man would leave his mother and okay. leave his wife, uh, thank not you, his husband thank or her husband. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, very, thank you very much, folks. Thank you. Um, we, we, we've, we've, all, we've all had a good say. Um, I'm going to ask you now to listen as I invite uh, Ms. Janie Gibson, policy uh, assistant in the GPPI, to give the vote of thanks. Janie Gibson.
protocol having been established. Good evening. <clears throat> On behalf of Government and Public Policy Institute, I wish to thank first the Honorable Philip Davis, Prime Minister and Minister of Finance for serving as special presenter in our 2022 Meet the Policy Lecture Series. I would like to thank you for using the occasion to energize public discussion of the National Development Plan for the Bahamas. The night's discussion has been an inspirited one, an enlightening one. There is appetite among Bahamians for a broad vision for the development of our nation to guide us into our fifth decade. God has given us one of the most beautiful countries in the world and the Bahamian people are well possessed to handle what God has given us. If we put in place the right plans, principles, policies, and people. I also wish to thank individuals who participated in tonight's program. Mrs. Shivago Lang, our able moderator. Mrs. Jenny Better for singing a beautiful rendition of the national anthem. Mrs. Natasha Williamson for the invocation. She surely set the mood for God's spirit to move in here tonight. Dr. Rodney Smith, I say thank you for the warm welcome. Mrs. Leslie Archer for introducing our special presenter. Tonight's event would not have been possible without the assistance of other departments areas here at the University of the Bahamas, namely Office of University Relations, Facilities Rental, Campus Police, Physical Plan Department, Protocol Officers, Sandra Dean Smith, and GPPI team. To all of you, I say thank you for your support and excellence. Finally, but by no means least, I'd like to thank you, our audience, who are here in person and watching live stream. Thank you for taking the time to attend and to watch and participate. As I bid you good night, I wish to invite you to continue to support GPPI's 2022 Policy Makers Lecture Series as we seek to broaden and deepen public discussion for better public policy making. I say good night and continue to keep the discussion live because we indeed have a nation to build. Good night. Somebody drop their keys.